In today's video, we have all the latest talk and speculation on a potential NHL return by former Montreal Canadian defenseman Andre Markov. There's some renewed talk around a Milan Lucic Louis Erickson trade with the Oilers and Canucks. And of course, we have the latest on the Mitch Marner contract situation. We'll get into all the latest coming up next. Welcome back to Top Shelf Hockey. If you're new to the channel, thanks for stopping by. We review and discuss all 31 NHL teams, so if you're a huge hockey fan, consider subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. So I want to kick things off here today by talking about a potential trade that we discussed before, but it seems to have a little bit of new life, at least in the media standpoint, between the Vancouver Canucks and the Edmonton Oilers, in what would basically be an exchange of bad contracts and struggling players who could certainly benefit from a fresh start. Now a while back there was some chatter about the possibility about the Edmonton Oilers trading forward Milan Lucic over to the Vancouver Canucks in exchange for forward Louis Erickson. Now that may not be an exact one for one trade. There could be some salary retained on either side depending on how the teams feel about everything. The contracts are not identical but they are close but there's some difference in term or whatnot that they may want to make some other adjustments to the deal to sort it out to get it to be a little bit more even. However, this was something that was previously mentioned and many thought might be a good idea. Yesterday, there was some renewed talk around this potential trade. TSN's Jason Greger had mentioned that he has sources from the Canucks side uh, believing that they have actually had discussions around this deal. Now, it doesn't mean that the Canucks were talking to the Oilers about it, but internally, the Jim Benning and his staff have tossed around this possibility of talking to the Oilers of for the Erickson and Lucic trade. So, obviously, it's something they're considering. Now, both players have had some comments here recently that kind of led you to believe that maybe they both would be open to a fresh start. We saw Louis Erickson's comments that came from overseas, basically indicating that he didn't have the trust of his head coach, Travis Green, that he wasn't happy with his playing time and there's some other things that he was saying basically to sum up he wasn't happy and didn't feel like he was going to be given much more of an opportunity to really improve things during his time in Vancouver and we've also heard Lucic on Vancouver radio say that he'd be very open at some point before the end of his career to be playing for his hometown Vancouver Canucks now of course that didn't really say anything about his situation with the Oilers I uh, didn't get into that but he's basically just saying that before his career is over he wouldn't mind having a chance to play for his hometown team now we've seen with the Edmonton Oilers lately that there's been a fair bit of significant change since Ken Hall was hired as GM. Yesterday we saw them announce new head coach Dave Tippett, so they're certainly heading in a new direction. We've seen some other people leave the organization from the management team. Craig McTavish has left. They announced yesterday that Paul Coffey was exiting the organization as well. One of their public relations people is no longer there either. There certainly seems to be some sweeping changes going on. Now some of these people left on their own accord, but I do believe they were likely given an opportunity to resign and move along as they are likely advised uh, that they kind of want to go in a different direction. Uh, but either way, uh, the Oilers appear to be a team going through a lot of changes. And so far, I must say I'm pleased with what Ken Holland seems to be putting in place here. I know it's still early and there's still lots of moves that could be made. But so far, so good in my opinion. Could we possibly see a Canucks and Oilers trade involving Lucic and Erickson? I do really think there is a distinct possibility. I would not be surprised to see these two teams actually get into a little bit more of a serious discussion around this. Leading up to the draft or during early in free agency here, obviously this could be a move to help both players get a fresh start, to see some value and maybe letting them give it a try with another organization and see if both of them can get some improvement here. Now a while back we had discussed the possibility about a couple of aging NHL veteran Russian players returning from the KHL, possibly coming back to the NHL and that was former Habs defenseman Andre Markov and former Red Wings forward Pavel Datsuk. Now there hasn't been much more update with Datsuk's situation but we do have some more information on Andre Markov. Apparently he's weighing out his options. We don't have all the fine firm details but apparently he has had discussions with as many as three NHL teams who do appear to be interested in signing him. And there is still interest from at least one KHL team as well. So he does have the possibility of returning back uh, to remain playing in the KHL. But I think more than likely his desire is to return to the NHL and likely would be a better payday for him as well. So it's not really clear on who the three teams are or if his former team, the Montreal Canadiens, are in the mix at all. That information has not been made public at all. There's no real talk around who he's been talking to but there does appear to be some interest so i'll pose this question to you again like i did before if you're a habs fan especially would you be interested in seeing andre markov return to the montreal canadians obviously he's a little bit older it's a little bit slower but he could be a mentor to that habs blue line they could have some good young defenders on the team this year and certainly from an experience level could possibly 
be of help there. But at the same time, you do have to be concerned about how much he can play and how much he can contribute at his current age and current abilities here. But let me know your thoughts down in the comment section and where you think Andre Markov might land in NHL this coming season should he actually get a contract. Now let's move along to the Toronto Maple Leafs and their situation with current pending RFA forward Mitch Marner. Now if you caught yesterday's video, uh, we certainly discussed a lot about RFAs and offer sheets, the compensation, and really went through that and explained it quite thoroughly. We discussed the top 10 teams that I thought were most likely to possibly use an offer sheet this coming summer. And we also took a look at some of the top players who likely would be to receive them as well based on their team's cap situation. We did touch on Marner a little bit in that video as well, but of course the main purpose was to look at it as a wide scope here and to determine if the offer sheet would be coming out at all for anybody this coming summer. Now, of course, yesterday afternoon, we also had a little bit of a bombshell news report from Darren Dreger from TSN uh, with some updates on the Marner contract situation. And a few things he said really got a lot of attention within the Toronto media and certainly raised a lot of questions that I wanted to bring up here with you today. Now, in case you're not aware, RFAs have the same rights as UFAs when it comes to free agency. When the interview period opens, which is usually about a week out before free agency this year, it's on June the 26th, they do have the option and legally can talk to other teams about contracts before July 1st rolls around. So like UFAs do, they go around, talk to teams, do some interviews, take a look at the facilities. They can talk to the team about their future, their strategies, all that stuff and help them have all that information in front of them to make a decision when July 1st comes, when the free agent period officially opens, when they're able to sign a contract. Now RFA certainly have all those same rights and can do all those same things. It's just something that generally doesn't happen very much. And when it usually does happen, it's not something that gets a lot of attention because it's not usually such a high profile player and a big market like we have here with Mitch Marner and the Toronto Maple Leafs. We've heard Maple Leaf general manager Kyle Dubas indicate before the season ending press conferences that he felt it was extremely important and imperative for the Maple Leafs to get a contract in place with Mitch Marner before July the 1st. And this is for a variety of reasons. But of course, Marner would not be eligible to receive an offer sheet before July 1st. So obviously he doesn't want another NHL club to dictate what they're going to pay Mitch Marner if their intention would be to match under any circumstances. The other part of the July 1st deadline here is that they obviously have other moves to make. They have some other contracts that need to get in place. Out of everything they need to do this summer, it's pretty obvious and clear that the Marner contract is going to be by far the biggest, most expensive move they make, and they need to get that settled to see what else they have available for cap space and resources to satisfy the rest of the roster. They might be looking to trade some players out to free up other space and whatnot. They could look to free agency to replace some other guys who might depart. This move is just going to have a lot of other implications on their team and on their organization for the coming year. So it's imperative that they get it done as soon as possible. Deer Drucker went on to say that he would be shocked if the interview period opened on June 26th and the Mariner camp did not begin meeting and interviewing with other NHL clubs to discuss the parameters of a potential offer sheet. He also said he fully expected contract negotiations with the Maple Leafs to go well beyond July the 1st. So obviously they're planning to drive a hard bargain, which they've done all along here. And he also said that he fully expected that Mitch Barner would not want to deal any more than five years. So obviously he's looking to march himself right to unrestricted free agency here is kind of what he was hinting at. If they go beyond that, then obviously the Leafs would be buying up some of his UFA years, which he appears to be not interested in doing if what he's saying here is indeed true. Now, keep in mind here as well, this information likely is coming from the Mariner camp and his agent here. Uh, and obviously, they're trying to drive a hard bargain. They're trying to negotiate through the media. And obviously, everything that they're saying here probably does have some truth to it, but may not be exact. Obviously, they're trying to put the pressure on the Maple Leafs to get the deal they want. He did go on here to reiterate again that he does believe Mariner wants a contract comparable to Austin Matthews. Obviously, they signed Tavares. At 11 million, Matthews is making even more than that. Marner feels that he is just as valuable, if not more, than to this team, and that he deserves to be paid comparable type money. Center is considered a premium position, which generally does get paid more money, as well as goal scorers. And Marner does score, but he is more of a setup, a playmaking type of winger as well. So, yes, he's very important, but there is an argument to be made that he wouldn't necessarily have to make quite as much as Tavares or Matthews here in this situation. Now also keep in mind that Kyle Dubas, like he said, he's come out and talked about July 1st as kind of being a, a deadline that he's kind of imposed for himself to get this accomplished here and get this in place so he can better satisfy the rest of the organization. So obviously if Kyle Dubas is able to get this done, if he's able to get Marner to take anything under uh, 10 million or even under 10.5 at this point, 
and get it done before July 1st. He's going to look really good here. Uh, the fan base is going to be super happy about that. That this doesn't drag on any further. And of course, Marner gets his hometown contract, which he's obviously going to get a lot of endorsement deals with. He's already got a crap load of endorsements here from the Toronto area. There's commercials everywhere. Uh, and obviously, he's not going to want to lose all that revenue. So I do firmly believe that Marner wants to stay with Toronto and that he and his agent are just kind of playing hardball, negotiating through the media here in order to get the best deal possible that they can. Now, if we take a quick look at the Maple Leaf salary cap situation, this really could have some major, major implications on how the rest of their offseason goes here. If you take a look at the screen, you'll see that the Maple Leafs currently have 17 contracts in place for the upcoming 1920 season. Those contracts have a total value of $74.2 million. That leaves them $8.79 million in salary cap space as of right now. You also have to keep in mind they have two UFA defensemen who played top four roles this past year in Ron Hainsey and Jake Gardner that they either need to sign or replace. They also have two other fairly prominent RFA forwards that played top nine roles the whole year in Kasperi Kapanen and Andreas Janssen. Now, I'm sure that their preference would be to keep all of their younger players. I do think it's quite possible that Hainsey and Gardner don't return. I think Gardner's probably as good as gone. I can see Hainsey possibly returning on a short-term, cheaper contract. He made $3 million last year. Maybe he'd take a little bit less to come back. Maybe they could get him around 2, 2.5. I'm not really sure what he would want for money, but I do think it's possible given the right situation that Hainsey could come back on a short-term deal. But Gardner's going to be looking for a longer-term deal, bigger money, and I think he's likely as good as gone. I just don't see, even if the Leafs want to, how they can make it happen here. As far as Kapanen and Janssen go, I would imagine they're both going to get bridge-type contracts somewhere anywhere from two, three, four, five years, like nothing longer than that. I would imagine the shorter the better in some of these cases here. They can continue to prove themselves and cash in again at a later time. I mean, they both had pretty solid years. Hard to say where those contracts are going to fall. At least three or four million is probably safe. Maybe even a little bit more. Kapanen might be more of a $5 million player. It's certainly debatable. Depends on term. There's a lot of other factors that go in here. But either way, they need to find some cap space to have a chance to keep a lot of this young core together. Now, one other move that you don't hear a lot of people talking about that they can do to free up some more cap space is they do have the contract of Nathan Horton, who's still not expired. It still has another year left, and it's $5.3 million. This past year, the contract was not used on the LTIR because they didn't need to, but they do have the option to place that on LTIR. Clearly, Horton is not coming back. will never play a game with the Leafs. So that would create some more space there and give them over $14 million in cap space between what they already have and freeing up that space from that contract. So that opens up the door here a little bit more. Then they have some other players who could be traded as well to free up some cap space. Prime targets meeting Nikita Zaitsev at four and a half million. You get Connor Brown making just over two million. We talked about the long possibility here that they could trade forward Nazem Kadri, who's got a very team-friendly contract. But if you take a look at the roster and who else they could move, uh, he's probably the second or third most likely, in my opinion, based on uh, contract and age. And if we factor everything in, and of course there's also the aging Patrick Marlowe who when they signed for that three-year contract, you know, that point is coming a problem now. He's making $6 million and has another year left. Uh, he was signed that contract over the age of 35, so it's buyout proof. They can't buy him out and gain any cap space that way. He's got a full no-move clause as well, so they can't trade him anywhere without his consent. And I really think he likes it in Toronto and would be likely unwilling to waive to make that happen. So either way, I think they're probably stuck with Marlowe. So that leaves your likely trade partners to be Zaitsev, Brown, Kadri, or one of the other RFAs here that they still hold rights to that need to be signed like Janssen or Kapanen. So there's about four or five players that they'd have to trade to free up some space. Even if they do end up giving Marner around 10, 11, 10 and a half million, anywhere in that range, even with the Horton contract going on the LTIR, that's still only going to leave them three, maybe four million at most to fill out the rest of their roster. And they're going to need a couple of defensemen and a couple of forwards. So they need to free up the space. How do you propose they do it? Of all the players I mentioned who could be traded, which ones do you think are the most likely here that will make the most sense in your opinion? They're also going to have Zach Hyman and Travis Dermott, who likely are going to end up on LTIR to start the season, which will free up more space and likely would kind of give them some more flexibility, some more leeway to buy some time to make some other decisions moving forward as well. So they don't necessarily have to make a bunch of trades throughout the summer. They could potentially see what they can do. And if they have to, they can start the season with some of these other guys and try to find deals for them early in the year before these other guys are able to come back and return. So what is the best way for the Maple Leafs to handle the Marner negotiations here? What do you feel is a fair contract 
for Mitch Marner going forward and which players end up being moved out to create the space to keep Marner and some of these other younger players who need new contracts. If you're new to the channel, I hope you consider subscribing. We cover all 31 NHL teams and there's plenty of content here for all hockey fans to enjoy. So if you're new, subscribe for more videos just like this one and give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I'd appreciate it if you did. As always, thank you for watching and we will catch you next time.